we're going to circle back and go back to our first guest right now and bring on Corrali Lopez Castro, attorney and a retail bankruptcy expert at Korzak Tropin and Throckmorton. Corrali, welcome to the show. Thank you, Michael. Great to be here. I'm glad you're here. All right. Everybody knows you're an attorney, but give us some more depth to you. I know that you, you've got a lot more. Some background on you, and then let's talk about this topic, your bankruptcy, what's going on with the new economy, and, and what you're running into these days, and why it's happening. Sure. Um, my, my name's Corey Lopez Castro. I've been a bankruptcy attorney for 27 years. I've done this for a long time, and I've represented many landlords in connection with retail bankruptcies. And um, we've been watching retail bankruptcies because, I guess, prior to 2016, it was really the year of the what I would call oil and gas bankruptcies. But since January 2016, the number of bankruptcies filed by retailers has been astonishing. And I think 2016, 2017 has definitely been the year of bank of retail bankruptcies. And just for some of your listeners. You know, some of those names that everyone may uh, recognize, Aeropostale, H.H. Gregg, Traffic Shoes, True Religion, Rue 21, Wet Seal, they all went into bankruptcy, and Toys R Us is currently now undergoing a, a bankruptcy. Okay. Go well, uh, Ed Baxter of Bison Creek Capital, I know that Michael had a question there, but uh, one thing that, that um, seems to be very important as far as retail bankruptcy is concerned, so there's about 100 companies that have gone, are going under or have gone under can you talk about the role that uh, some of the giant private equity firms has played as far as dividend recaps is concerned in taking those companies into bankruptcy? Obviously, Payless Shoes and Sports Authority come to mind when you think about those, but what role do you think they've played in uh, helping those bankruptcies occur? Well, I think that the uh, many of these companies, like I think about Payless, Gymboree, Route 21, and True Religion, they were all over-leveraged. Okay. There was no question about that. And in fact, when they emerged from bankruptcy, their debt load was severely, severely reduced. So I think that um, some of this private equity money has recognized that the, there's too much debt. The companies cannot operate uh, profitably. They have to go into bankruptcy in order to restructure the balance sheet. And that may be a nice segue into whether reworking the balance sheet and not reworking the operations is really going to get you where you need to go with respect to these retailers. Keep going, Ed. Okay. And, you know, so I think, like, for example, Payless, I think their debt load when they went into, uh, into bankruptcy was about $829 million and they emerged with $400 million. So that's a severe reduction in what their debt was at. Jim Burry did the same thing. They also emerged from bankruptcy with respect to a lot fewer locations. Exactly. So they kept the, one of the one of the key benefits to going into a bankruptcy is that you can either accept uh, assume leases that you want or reject leases. And that's why pe most of the time when you have a retailer that has multiple locations, you want to, in essence, cherry pick those locations that are working and close the ones that are not in order to reduce, you know, what you have to pay on a monthly basis for your operations. So those four examples that I gave you reduce their, um, their locations. An interesting aspect of this that I find is the landlords at these locations have become almost partners. They're trying to solve the problem as well, because when the when the retailer goes in, they probably want some rent concessions from their landlords, especially the landlords that they're going to continue to do business with. The landlords do not have to do that, because in bankruptcy, you either assume the lease as is or you reject it. You can't go in and pick what you like, what you don't like about a particular lease. But you see the landlords and some of the big landlords that we know of really working with these retailers, A, they don't want those spaces vacant. You also have co-tenancy clauses that could be a problem, i.e., if, for example, your big, uh, your big tenant goes dark, other tenants may have in their leases options to terminate because exactly. that big tenant has, has gone dark. And no one wants a d dark spaces in their malls. But, you know, one of the reasons that we've seen this number of retailers is because you have the lack of foot traffic at malls, you have the changing trends at what we call fast fashion and whether these retailers can actually catch up or keep 
uh, keep up with that. And then you have brand loyalty or lack thereof. I mean, the whole landscape has changed. I remember uh, hearing someone talk about whether you know, what's the key to this? And they said, if a retailer goes away, the real question is, will the customer miss it or not? When we talk about the dark spots, I think some of the, just to contrast this, some of the good spots is the Zara retailer from Spain. I mean, that, that retailer has, doesn't do any um, advertising, has a very, very good online presence, but you see the young people going to their store, seeing what's new. They change their inventory, you know, twice uh, a week, and they have been able to set up their supply chain in a way that they can bring that new inventory uh, very quickly into the stores. I don't think everyone else is set up that way. Their, their supply chain is not so nimble, and it really is killing them with respect to consumers who are much more um, sophisticated now, and they have a smartphone, and they're going to look through their smartphone, they're going to look for the best price, and they're going to look for the fashions that they like. Well, the ability, obviously the ability to pivot as a retailer is extremely important when you look at those particular yep. scenarios. That's that's what they're missing right there, and that and the fact that you know, I, I have two millennials of my own, and I've watched kind of this uh, – shopping behavior kind of changed from where we would go to a mall or go to a particular store and they would buy this and that. Now, as you mentioned, they're on their phone, they're on their computers, most of their phone, they're buying things online and boxes just show up at the front door of the house. And that's a big thing that's hurting them too. And you mentioned the dark side. Uh, what I what I was concentrating on as far as was the leverage. I think the leverage is as much to do because it's, it, it prohibits them from pivoting and changing inventory uh, uh, policies because when, you, when, you're, uh, uh, when you're assuming that much debt, and that debt typically is pretty significant in some of these takeovers, like we saw some of the big ones, whether it's, you know, whether it's a sports authority, Guitar Center, or others, or even Sears, you see what, what that debt does to them as far as uh, taking those businesses back to the dark ages and not having the, the ability to pivot and be more innovative. Has that been part of what you've seen with regard to some of the relationships and the bankruptcies? You know, I think that that's the plan, but it's. I think it's still. We still have to see whether that's actually going to be the case. So, for example, True Religion, right? It emerged from bankruptcy with fewer locations and with a lot less debt. But now they have to determine how do they get that customer back into their stores or online, and that's the true test, okay? Because the consumer. There's this brand loyalty is so critical. You may have less debt, you may have less stores, you may be more nimble, but if you are not able to attract that customer, it doesn't matter what your debt is. So it if seems people so are not buying if people are not buying your, your, your merchandise, then you really have not changed fundamentally what you need to change in order to make your brand, your operations successful. It's the message and the delivery of the message, more investment on that side than there is on anything else that they've done. It seems to me if they're going to get that customer back and maintain a, a, a profitable business going forward, that seems to be the big point. Right. I mean, and you didn't say it, but I think you're alluding to it as well which has to do with social media and the social media effect, right? Right. So you have some of these stars and celebrities who can make a brand very cool, right? Yep. And the young people who are checking their Instagram account are looking at someone, oh, look what they're wearing. They're wearing this today, right? They're saying, I want to look like that. You know, that aspiration. They want to imitate and, and have that, that look. And I think social media is having a huge effect it's a huge effect in that can you actually achieve the cool factor got it right? all right that is that, it cool like you I, I, <laughs> is it cool like you that's a good we, we need to use that one again all right that's all the time we have for you today but i want to appreciate you you coming onto the show if somebody needs to reach out to you how do they do that um i'm an attorney in miami florida and you can feel free to email me at c l c my initials at kttlaw.com. My law firm is Kozak, Tropin, and Throckmorton. Great. Corral, thank you so much for being a guest on the show. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. You're welcome. All right. This show has been brought to you by Tycom Partners. We'll be back on the other side of this break with CEO Money. Hold tight. We've got more for you.